Every time you open a window on Linux, you're using code written in the 1980s. But what I'm about to tell you isn't some boring story about outdated software. It's the story of a secret war, corporate betrayals, and a piece of technology so brilliant it's still powering the most powerful computers on Earth. I'm talking about Xorg. And trust me, by the end of this video, you'll realize this stuff is way cooler than you think. Get ready, because we're about to uncover how four programmers changed the world, how a single line of code destroyed a software empire, and why Wall Street traders still refuse to use Wayland. It all starts in 1984, at the MIT labs. But not with Linux. Linux didn't even exist yet. A group of researchers working on Project Athena had a problem. How do you run graphical applications on computers connected across a network? Their solution was so revolutionary that it still feels like science fiction today. They decided to completely separate the brain of an application from its graphical body. Basically, you could run a program on a server in Japan and see it perfectly on your screen in Italy as if it were running locally. And what did they name this system? X, because it was the successor to the W window system. Brilliant in its simplicity. Bob Scheifler and Jim Geddes. Remember those names because they're literally the fathers of the modern desktop. Created something no one had ever imagined before. A network protocol that pretended to be a local graphics system. And here's the genius part. Instead of hiding this architecture, they made it the core of the system. Every window, every click, every pixel you see goes through this network protocol even if everything is running on your own machine. But this is where the first betrayal begins. X11 was open source, right? Wrong. MIT released it under a permissive license, and the corporations did what they always do. They took it and locked it up. Sun, IBM, HP, Digital Equipment, all of them created their own proprietary versions of X11 for their $50,000 workstations. And here's the kicker. Each added their own proprietary extensions, making their versions incompatible with each other. Want to run a Sun app on an HP workstation? Good luck. MIT had created an open standard, and the corporations turned it into a golden cage. But in 1991, something happened that changed everything. A Finnish guy named Linus Torvalds released Linux, a completely free and open source operating system. There was just one problem. It only ran in text mode. No windows, no graphics, no desktop. And that's when our heroes of 1992 enter the scene. Four programmers, David Dawes, Glenn Lai, Jim Sillis, and David Wexelblatt, looked at their 386 PCs and asked a dangerous question. What if we freed X11 from corporate hands and brought it to home computers? Everyone told them it was impossible. X11 only ran on proprietary Unix workstations costing tens of thousands of dollars. PCs were considered toys. But these four didn't give up. They took the original MIT code, adapted it for Intel 386 processors, and most importantly, they made it truly free. No proprietary licenses, no corporations telling you what you could do. They called it X-Free 86, literally X-Free for 386 processors. And it worked. It worked so well that it saved Linux from oblivion. Without X-Free 86, Linux would have remained a server-only OS with no graphical interface. For 12 years, X386 was the graphical system for Linux. Every distribution from Red Hat to SUSE ran on X386. It became so essential that people forgot Sun and IBM's proprietary versions even existed. The four heroes of 92 had won. They had liberated X11 and democratized graphical computing. But then came a twist no one expected. The liberator was about to become the new dictator. January 2004. David Dawes, by now the undisputed leader of the project, made a decision that rocked the entire open source world. He changed the X-Free86 license by adding a clause many considered incompatible with the GPL. Chaos erupted, developers revolted, Linux distributions panicked, and out of this chaos rose a new hero, Keith Packard. Keith didn't just protest, he forked the X-Free86 code, created the Xorg Foundation, and released the first version of Xorg in September 2004. Within six months, Ubuntu, Red Hat, C, basically every major Linux distro had abandoned X-Free86 for Xorg. It was the fastest and most coordinated migration in open source history. X-Free86, after more than a decade of dominance, disappeared from circulation in under a year. But Zorg didn't just copy X-Free86, no. 
Keith Packard and his team did something bolder. They broke that gigantic monolith into hundreds of modular components. Today, Exorg isn't a single program. It's an ecosystem of over 200 separate modules working together like a perfectly tuned orchestra. Graphics drivers, input managers, display servers, 3D extensions, all separate, yet synchronized to the nanosecond. And now, the really cool stuff no one ever tells you. Rander, the extension that manages your multiple monitors, it can change resolution, orientation, and display setup in real time without restarting anything. Try doing that on Windows without issues. My Tim, this one's for hackers. It lets applications share video memory directly, bypassing the kernel completely. The result? Rendering speeds that would make macOS cry. And then there's GLX. While Microsoft was busy arguing with OpenGL, Xorg had already integrated it natively. Every 3D effect you see on a Linux desktop goes through GLX. But the craziest? X Input 2. This system simultaneously handles mice, keyboards, touchscreens, graphics tablets, multi-touch trackpads, even game controllers, all with sub-5 millisecond latency. And then came 2008. A guy named Christian Higsberg says, Xorg is old, let's replace it with Wayland. And everyone goes, finally Xorg is dead. Spoiler, it's not dead. In fact, here's a secret few people know. Even when you're using Wayland, you're still using Xorg. It's called X Wayland, and it's literally Xorg disguised as Wayland to run legacy apps. So why does Xorg survive? Simple, it does things Wayland still can't. Want to share your screen on a video call? Xorg. Want to remotely control your computer? Xorg. Want to automate mouse clicks and keyboard input for your scripts? Xorg. And then there's gaming. Here's where it gets interesting. The performance difference between Xorg and Wayland isn't as clear-cut as people think. Recent benchmarks show mixed results. Sometimes Xorg wins, sometimes Wayland does, and it often depends on your specific hardware and compositor. But here's what I's clear. Many pro streamers and content creators still prefer Xorg because it's predictable. When you're streaming to thousands of viewers, you can't afford surprises or compatibility issues with your streaming software. And for professional workstations, the choice often comes down to workflow reliability. Financial trading firms, CAD workstations, and scientific computing centers stick with Xorg not necessarily because it's faster, but because their critical software stack has been tested and optimized for X11 over decades. When millions of dollars or research data are on the line, if it ain't broke, don't fix it becomes the golden rule. Now, let me show you tricks only real Linux geeks know. Open a terminal and type xwininfo. Click on any window. Boom, you just hacked that window. Size, position, process ID, window class, all yours. That's nothing. Type XEV and move your mouse in the opened window. You'll see every single event in real time. Every click, every move, every keystroke becomes matrix-like code streaming across your terminal. Want to really impress someone? Create a custom resolution. Open your xorg.conf and add a personalized model line. You can literally invent resolutions that don't exist and force your monitor to use them. Here's the $10,000 trick. If you're getting screen tearing in games, don't install any third-party tools. Just edit the device section in your xorg.conf, add option tear free true, and enjoy a smoothness even Macs can't match. But the wildest part is yet to come. Xorg is running on Android. Yes, you heard that right. Some mad developers ported Xorg to phones, and now you can run full Linux desktop apps on a smartphone. Cloud companies are using Xorg to create virtual desktops streamed like videos. It's basically Netflix for desktops. And then there's VR. While everyone talks about the metaverse, some crazy folks are adapting Xorg to run virtual reality headsets. Imagine using LibreOffice in an infinite 3D workspace. But here's the final jaw dropper. Your smartphone interface traces its roots back to X11. Multi-touch gestures, overlapping window management, compositing systems, all born from concepts invented for X11 in the 1980s. Even iOS and macOS took inspiration from X11's windowing architecture. So next time someone tells you Xorg is old and useless, remind them of this story. Xorg isn't just legacy software. It's the invisible architect of the digital age. It has survived corporate wars, tech revolutions, and replacement attempts because it does one simple thing. It always works. While Wayland may be the future, Xorg remains the reliable present.
powering satellites, supercomputers, trading floors, and the workstations of the world's top animation studios. Next time you click an icon, remember, you're using technology that's almost 40 years old and still innovating. See you in the next video. And remember, in a world of Wayland, Beaksorg.